You Are Not So Smart by David McCraney Chapter 1. Priming The Misconception You know when you are being influenced and how it is affecting your behavior. The Truth You are unaware of the constant nagging you receive from ideas formed in your unconscious mind. You are driving home from the supermarket and you realize you forgot to buy salsa dip which was the only reason you went there in the first place. Maybe you could buy some at the petrol station. Nah, you just get it next trip. Thoughts of the dip lead to remunerations of the price of petrol, which lead to excogulation over bills, which lead to thoughts about whether you can afford a new television, which remind you of the time you watch an entire season of Battlestar Galactica in one sitting. What the hell? You are home already and no recollection of the journey. You drove home in a state of highway hypnosis. Your mind and your body seemingly float along in parallel. When you stop the car, you turn the key. You snap out of a dreamlike state, sometimes called line hypnosis. When describing the dis disassociative mental world of an assembly line worker stuck in a repetitive grind, in this place, consciousness drips as one mental task goes into autopilot and the rest of the mind muses about less insipid affairs, floating away into the umbra. You split your subjective experience into consciousness and subconsciousness, subconsciousness all the time. You are doing it right now. Breathing, blinking, swallowing, maintaining your posture and holding your mouth closed while you read. You could pull those systems into conscious control or leave them to the automatic nervous system. You could, you could drive cross country consciously adjusting your foot on the accelerator, shifting your hands on the wheel, mulling over the millions of micro decisions needed to avoid ganashing metallic death at high speeds. Or you could sing along with your friends while the other parts of your mind handle the mundane stuff. You accept your unconscious mind as just another weird component of the human experience. But you tend to see it as a separate thing. A primal self underneath consciousness that doesn't have the keys to the car. Science has learned otherwise. A great example of how potent a force of unconscious can be was detailed by researchers Jean Beaujou at the University of Toronto and Kate Lelgenquist at Northern University in 2006, paper published in the journal Science. They conducted a study in which people were asked to remember a terrible sin from their past, something they had done which was unethical. The researcher asked them to describe how the memory made them feel. They then offered half of the participants the opportunity to wash their hands. At the end of the study, they asked subjects if they would be willing to take part in later research but no pay as a favor to a desperate graduate student. Those who did not wash their hands agreed to help 74% of the time, but those who did wash agreed on only 41% of the time. According to the researchers, one group had unconsciously washed away their guilt and felt less of need to pay penance. The subject didn't truly really wash their emotions, nor did they consciously feel as thought they had. Cleansing has meaning beyond just avoiding germs. According to Jung and Langenquist, most human cultures use the idea of cleanliness and purity as opposed to filth and grime to describe both physical and moral states. Washing is part of many religious rituals and metaphorical paces used in everyday language, and referring to the stardly deeds as being dirty or to evil people as scum is also, is also common. You even make the same face when feeling this disgusted about a person's action as you do when seeing something gross. Uncos unconsciously, the people in the study connected their hand washing with all the interconnected ideas associ associated with the act. And then, 
and then those associations influence their behavior. When a stimulus in the past affects the way you behave and think or the way you perceive another stimulus later on, it is called priming. Every perception, no matter if you consciously notice, sets off a chain of related ideas in your neutral network. Pencils make you think of pens. Blackbirds make you think of classrooms. It happens to you all the time. And thought you, you are unaware, it changes the way you behave. One of many studies that have revealed how much influence your subconscious mind has over the rest of your thinking and behavior and how easily it can be influenced by priming was conducted in 23 by Aaron Kay, Christian Wheeler, John Barghand, and Lee Ross. People were separated into two groups and asked to draw lines between photos and text descriptions. One group looked at natural photos, they drew lines to connect kites, whales, turkeys, and other objects to descriptions on the other side with the paper. The second group connected lines to, desc to descriptions of photos of briefcase, fountain pens, and other items associated with the world of business. Participants were then moved into isolated rooms and told they had been paired off with another subject. The other person was actually in, the, in on the experiment. Its person was told they were going to play a game in which they could earn up to $10. The researchers presented the subject with a cup and explained two strips of paper weighted inside. One with the word offer written on it and the other with the word decision. The subject was then given a choice. Blindly pluck a slip of paper from the cup or allow the other person to blindly select. The catch. Whoever pulled out the offer slip would get the $10 and choose how it was divided between both parties. The partner would then choose to accept or reject the offer. If the, par if the partner reject, both receive nothing. This is called the ultimatum game. And this predict predictability has made in a favorite tool of psychologists and economists. Offers below 20% of the total amount are usually turned down. Most people choose to do the picking. They didn't know both slips had offer written on them. If they instead let the other person do the picking, the actor pretend to get decision slip. So everyone in the study was put into the position of making a reasonable offer, knowing if they, if they did not, they would miss out on some free cash. The results were bizarre, but confirmed the scientists' suspicions about priming. So how did the two groups differ? In the group who connected neutral photos to their descriptions before the ultimatum game, 91% choose to split the money evenly, $5 each. In the group who connected the business photos, only 33% offered the split the money evenly. The rest tried to, to keep a little more for themselves. The researchers ran the experiment again with real objects instead of photos. They had participants play the ultimatum game in a room which a briefcase, a leather portfolio on the far end of the table along with a fountain pen in front of the participant's chair. Another group sat in a room with neutral items, a backpack, a cardboard box, and a wooden pencil. This time, 100% of the neutral group choose to split the money evenly, but only 50% of those in the group sitting in a room with the business-related items did the same. Half of the business prime group tried to st stiff the other party. All of the subjects were debriefed afterwards as to why they behave as they did, but no one, but not one person mentioned the objects in the room. Instead, they confabulated and told the researchers about their own feelings on what is and is not fair. 
Some described their impression of the people they were playing the game with and said those feelings influenced them. Mere exposure to briefcase and fancy pens had altered the behavior of normal, rational people. They became more competitive, greedier, and had no idea why. Faced with having to explain them themselves, they rationalized their behavior with erroneous tales they believed they were true. The same researchers conducted the experiment in other ways. They have subjects complete words with some of the letters omitted and again, those who first saw business-related images would turn a word like C, P, T into competitive. 70% of the time, while only 42% of the neutral group did. If shown an ambiguous conversation between two men trying to come to an agreement, those first saw photos of business-related objects saw it as a neg negotiation, whereas the natural group saw an attempt to compromise. In every case, the subject minds were altered by unconscious, unconscious priming. Just about every physical object you encounter triggers a, a blitz of associ association through your mind. You are on the computer connected to two cameras. Reality is in a vacuum where you objectively survey your surroundings. You construct reality from a minute to minute with memories and emotion orbiting your sensations and cognition. Together they form a collage of consci consciousness that exists only in your skull. Some objects have personal meaning like friendship bracelet your best friends gave you in the primary school or the handkerchief handcrafted mittens your sister made you. Other items have cultural or universal meanings like the moon or the knife or the hand full of posies. They affect you whether whether or not you are aware of their power. Sometimes so far in the depths of your brain you never notice. Another version of the ex experiment used only smell. In 2005, Hank Arts, the Utrecht University had subjects fill out a, question, a questionnaire. They were rewarded with a cookie. One group sat in a room filled with the faint smell of cleaning products while another smelled nothing. The group primed by the aroma in the clean smelling room cleaned up after themselves three times more often. In a study by Ron Friedman, where people were merely shown but not allowed to drink sport drinks or bottled water, those who just looked at sport drink persisted longer in the task of physical endurance. Priming works best when you are on autopilot, when you aren't trying to consciously introspect before choosing how to behave. When you are unsure how best to proceed, suggestions bubble up from the deep and that are highly tainted by subconscious primes. In addition, your brain hates ambiguity and is willing to take shortcuts to remove it from any situation. If there is nothing else to go on, you will use what is available. When pattern recognition fails, you create patterns of your own. In the aforementioned experiments, there was nothing else for the brain to buy to base its unconscious attitudes on. So it focused on the business items or the clean smells and ran with the ideas. The only, the only problem was the conscious minds of the subjects didn't notice. You can't sell prime, not directly. Priming has to be unconscious. More specifically, it has to happen within the psychologist referred to as the adaptive unconscious. A place largely inaccessible. When you are driving a car, the adaptive unconscious is performing mil millions of calculations, predicting every moment, accommodating, adjusting your mood, and manipulating organs. It does the hard work freeing up your conscious mind to focus on executive decisions. You are always of two minds at any one moment, the higher level rational self and the lower level emotional self. 
Science author Johann Lehrer wrote extensively about division in his book How We Decide. Lehrer sees the two minds as equals who communicate and argue about what to do. Simple, simple problems involving unfamiliar variables are the best handled by the rational brain. They must be simple because you can juggle only 4 to 9 bits of information in your conscious rational mind at one time. For instance, look at this sequence of letters and then recite them out loud without looking. F T F B I I R S B B C U S S R. Unless you caught on, this is really difficult task. Now, chuck this let chuck these letters into manageable portion like this. FD, FBI, IRS, BBC, USSR. Look away now and try to recite them. It should be much easier. You just took 15 bits and reduced them into 5. You chunk all the time to better analyze your world. You reduce the complex rush of inputs into shorthand versions of reality. This is why the invention of written language which was such an important step in your history. It allowed, it allowed you to take notes and preserve data outside the limited capacity of the rational mind. Without tools like pencils, computers, and slide rules, the rational brain is severely hampered. The emotional brain, the hair argues, is, is older, thus more evolved than the rational brain. It is better suited for complex decisions and automatic pro processing of very complex operations like somersaults and breakdancing, singing on the key and shuffling cards. Those operations seem simple, but they had too many steps and variables for your rational mind to handle. You handle those tasks over the adaptive unconscious. Animals with small cerebral cortices or none at all are mostly on autopilot because their older emotional brains are usually or totally in charge. The emotional brain, the unconscious mind, is old, powerful, and no less part of who you are and than the rational brain is. But its function can be directly observed or communicated to consciousness. Instead, the output is mostly intuition and feeling. It is, a, it is always there in the background, co-processing your mental life. Leher's central argument, you know more than you know. You make the mistake of believing only your rational mind is in control, but your rational mind is, is usually obvious to the influence of your unconscious. In this book, I'll add another proposition. You are unaware of, of how unaware you are. In a hidden place, your unconscious mind, your experience is always being crunched or so suggestion can be handed up to your conscious mind. Thanks to this, if a situation is familiar, you can fall back on intuition. However, if the situation is novel, you will have to boot up your conscious mind. The spell of highway hypnosis on a long trip is always broken. When you take an exit into unfamiliar territory, the same is true to any part of your life. You are always drifting back and forth between the influence of emotion and reason. Automatic automaticity and ex executive orders. Your true self is much larger and more complex construct than you are aware of at, a at any given moment. If your behavior is a result of priming, the result of suggestion as to how to behave handled up from the adaptive unconscious. You often invent narratives to explain your feelings and decisions and must think because you, are, you aren't aware of the advice you've given by the mind behind the curtain in your head. When you hug someone, you love and then feel the rush of warm emotions. 
you have made an executive decision which then influenced the other parts of your brain to deliver nice chemicals top-down influence make intuitive sense and isn't disturbing to the to ponder bottom-up influence is out when you sit next to a briefcase and act more greedily than you usually would it is an it is as if you exec executive brain centers are nodding in agreement to hidden adversaries whispering in your head advisors whispering in your head it seems mysterious and creepy because it's so cland clandestine those who seek to influence you are sensitive to this and try to avoid creating in you the uncomfortable rela realization that you have been duped priming works only if you aren't aware of it and those who depend on priming to put food on the table work very hard to keep their influence hidden look at casinos which are temples to priming at very turn there are dings and musical notes the clatter of coins rattling in metal buckets symbols of wealth and opulence better still casinos are sensitive to the power of the situation once you are inside there is no indications of time of day no advertisements for anything not available inside the box of mutually beneficial primes no reason to leave whether to sleep eat or anything else no external priming allowed coca-cola stumbled on the power of santa claus to prime you during the holidays Thoughts of childhood, happiness, and wholesome family values appear in your subconscious as you choose between Coke or the generic brand of cola. Supermarkets notice an increase in sales when the smell of freshly baked bread prime people to buy more food. Adding the words all natural or all or including pictures of pastoral farms and crops primes you with thoughts of nature. Dissuading thoughts of factories and chemical preservatives. TV channels and large corporations prime potential audiences by adopting an image, a brand, so as to meet you halfway before you decide how to engage and judge them. Production companies spend millions of dollars to create trailers and movie posters to form first impressions so you are primed to enjoy their films in a certain way right up until the opening titles. Restaurants decorate their interiors to make to communicate everything fine dining to psychedelic hippie communists in order to prime you to enjoy their cheese sticks from every corner of the modern world advertisers are launching attacks on your unconscious in an attempt to prime you to prime your behavior to be more favorable from the bottom lines of their clients businesses discovered priming before psychologists did but once psychologists, psychologists started digging into the mind, more and more examples of automaticity were uncovered. And even today, it isn't clear how much your behavior is under your, unco your conscious control. The question who is truly in the driver's seat was made far more complex in 1996 by a series of studies published by John Barg in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology. He, he, had New York, he had New York University students unscramble 30 separate five-word sentences. He told them he, has, he was interested in their language abilities, but he was really studying priming. He assembled three groups, one, uns, one unscrambled sent, sent, sentences which terms associated with aggression and rudeness such as brazen, disturb, and bluntly, Another group unscrambled words from the bank of polite terms like courteous and behave. A third group served as a control which words like gleefully prepares and exercising. The experimenters told the students how to complete the task and once they've done to come find them to receive the second assignment. But this was the real experiment. When each student approached the researcher, he or she would already engage in the conversation with an actor who was pretending to be 
having trouble understanding the word puzzles. The research researchers completely ignored the student until he or she interrupted the conversation or, or 10 minutes passed. The result, the polite word group waited on average of 9.3 minutes to interrupt. The natural group waited 8.7 minutes, and the rude word group waited around 5.4 minutes. To the researchers' surprise, more than 80% of the polite word group waited the full 10 minutes. Only 35% of the rude word group chose not to interrude. The subjects were interviewed after the experiment and couldn't pinpoint why they chose to wait or to interrupt. The question never entered their minds because as far as they know, their behavior had not been influenced. The scrambled sentences they believe had not affected them. In the second experiment, Barg had participants unscramble sentences like contain words associated with old age, like retired, wrinkled, and bingo. He then clocked participants' speed as they walked down the hall to a lift and compared it to the speed they walked when they first strolled in. They took about one to two extra seconds to reach their destination. Just as with the rude word groups, the old word groups were primed by the ideas and associations of the words created. To be sure, this was really a result of priming. Bark repeatedly the experiment and got the same result. He ran in a third time with a control group whose unscrambled words related to sadness to be sure he hadn't simply depressed people into walking slower. Once again, the old group tottered along the longest. Park also conducted a study in which Caucasian participants sat down at a computer to fill out boring questionnaires. Just before each section began, photos of their African-American or Caucasian men flashed on the screen for 13 milliseconds, faster than the participants could consciously process. Once they completed the task, the computer flashed an error message on the screen, telling the participants they had to start o over from the beginning. Those exposed to the images of African American became hostile and frustrated more easily and more quickly than subjects who saw Caucasian faces. Even thought they didn't believe themselves to be racist or to harbor negative stereotypes. The ideas were still in their neutral networks and unconsciously primed them to behave differently than usual. Studies of priming suggest when you engage in a deep introspection over the cause of your own behavior, you miss many perhaps most of the influence accumulating on your pers persona like barnacles along the side of the ship. Priming doesn't work if you see it coming but your attention can be focused in all directions at once. Much of, the, much of what you think, feel, do, and believe is and will continue to be, nudged on one way or the other by unconscious primes from words, colors, objects, personalities, and other miscellany influence with meaning either from your personal life or the, or the culture you identify with. Sometimes these primes are Unintended. Sometimes there is an agent on the other's other end who plotted against your judgment. Of course, you can choose to become an agent yourself. You can prime potential employers in which what you were on the job interview. You can prime the emotion of your guest with how you set the mood when you when hosting a party. Once you know priming is a fact of life, you start to understand the power and resilience of rituals and rites of passage, norms, and ideologies. Systems designed to prime persist because they work. Starting tomorrow, maybe with just a smile and a thank you, you can affect the way others feel, hopefully for the best. Just remember, you are most open to suggestion when you are mentally cruising, mentally whose control is on or when you find yourself in an unfamiliar circ circumstances. If you bring a shopping list, you'll be less likely to arrive at the checkout with a cart full of stuff you have no intention of buying when you left the house. If you neglect your personal space and allow chaos and clutter to creep in, it will affect you. 
and perhaps encourage further neglect. Positive feedback loops should improve your life, not detract from it. You can't prime yourself directly, but you can create environments conducive to the mental states you wish to achieve. Just like the briefcase on the table, or the, or the clean aroma in the room, you can fill your personal spaces with paraphernalia infused with meaning, or find meaning in, in the larger idea of owning, owning little, no matter when you least expect, expect it. Those meanings may nudge you. You are not so smart. By David McCraney